Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. It's a great day. It's draft day in the NFL. I love this day. I have my weekend plan all around my couch and my television because I love the NFL draft. And uh, so that starts today. Be no, there'll be no mystery as to who uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars pick, obviously. Uh, Trevor Lawrence will be their guy. And uh, I'm sure when some hear this, they'll already know that. But nonetheless, it's a fun day for me television-wise. So it's a, it's a good day. And I'm, I'm wearing a free T-shirt. How's that? Not bad, huh? I like it. So it's I all like it. cost is right. Uh, everything is good. And uh, so this is – the thing about this show we're doing today, Conrad, is that it's probably – I don't know how well we all handled everything. Cause there's so many moving parts. And as you'd like to say, there was a lot to unpack here. And, uh, and, and we had to sense unpacking, but nonetheless, it was an interesting time, time of transition, uh, on the roster after the Austin turn, all that good stuff. So it's a, a very tumultuous time for us. And, you know, I don't think we're, you're ever ready to lose two baby faces named Steve Austin and the rock. No, from your, from that side of the roster, it kind of leaves the cupboard a little bit bare. So but we'll get into all that and talk about that. There's not much we could do about it in hindsight, but nonetheless, it was an interesting time. So, uh, should be good. Should be good. Should be a fun show. I'm ready to have some fun, Conrad. I'm a little fired up today too, by the way. I like it. I like when we get red ass Jr. It's, uh, it's do we have a red ass Jr. shirt. We do over at boxing And somebody even suggested. You needed a red ass barbecue sauce, like your spicy version of the barbecue. Should yeah. Be what, red I, ass. what I'm, what I'm kind of holding that back for is the hot sauce. I like it. I'm going to, we're going to develop a hot sauce and, and some of my trips back to Oklahoma. Now that the COVID thing is lightened up now that I've had my second vac vaccine, uh, which I'm proud to say, uh, yep. Thank you. Get old like me, man. You gotta be careful. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, everybody's got to be careful. Quite frankly, if you can get the vaccine, unless it's against your religion or your politics, I'd, I'd suggest doing it. You know, my arm didn't get sore. I, I got by real good, man. I no after effects, no, no nothing, but I didn't do the Johnson and Johnson. I did some, some other brand, but nonetheless, uh, when, when I'm getting back to Oklahoma, I'm going to start doing more, uh, that's where I can really do my research and development because I can taste things really quick and, uh, tweak and I enjoy that. We did the same thing with our, every product we've got, we developed it. And when I was able to go to Oklahoma city where they're all made and, uh, get into the groove of the, with the manufacturer tasting and it is a little bit of this, it needs a little bit of that. So, uh, we're going to work on that deal, but <clears throat> it's a good time of the year, man. It's the grilling season. We hope to have all of our stuff. You know, we've been sucking high teat on our neck gum, uh, seasoning and mustard and I'm told by the powers that be in our spot in Oklahoma that we're, uh, we're due. And, uh, 
you know, sometimes things happen. You know how this shit goes, man. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you can't, you can't foresee it. Well, they're, they're going to be a run on your, by the way, next week, Kreskin says, I'm dating myself again, that, uh, you know, you're going to have a great week selling, uh, seasoning. And so the, then you don't ever forecast that the company that you've been buying it from all along has been very much on time, very much on top of things. It's going to have electric, uh, not electrical, but technical issues on their line. So, you know, things happen and you get out of your control. All you can do is tell you, your customers what's going on and, uh, and hope they will be patient and hang with you. So that's kind of what we're hoping on. But other than that, things are really good though. Business is good. Things are good. I'm feeling good. So everything, AEW ratings have been pretty nice. Everybody's kind of happy about that. So uh, I was surprised that uh, we did as well as we did because I just, the, in, the increase, I mean, the, well, I can't, I saw something that said we had a 70% increase or something or something, some ridiculous number, probably wasn't that. Yeah, you know, so maybe something one of the demos was like that. But yeah, the, the first week unopposed did 1.2 million. I think a lot of people wouldn't have called that yeah i thought we might do you know 900 that was being i thought that was being kind of generous but to do 1.2 million that was pretty phenomenal so hopefully we will earn the trust and the uh and the uh, dedication from the audience and the only way we're going to do that is have a, a hell of a show every week is that possible i don't know i know the effort will be there and as long as Tony Khan's got these creative ideas, uh, I, I think we're, we're in pretty good shape to do that. And the thing we've talked about here, Conrad, is <laughs> you and I have talked about off the air too. A lot of our young talents are getting better. Right. They're getting older, oh, over, and they're getting older. We're all getting older each day, by the way. That's a revelation. Uh, so I think they're getting better, and I think they're, they're assuming their roles better. My gosh, look at the ratings, I think the quarter hour rating of on the first week we were back unopposed for Darby Allen was extraordinary. And yeah. he's a homegrown talent. That's right. So people say, well, you can't make stars in this generation. You know, too much information flow. And you can, if you do it right. And the talent executes and, and, and creates a unique presentation. And certainly Darby Allen is a, is a very unique competitor. He reminds me a lot of Jeff Hardy. Mm -hmm. I used to call Jeff Hardy the strange enigma. I got to figure out something to call a Darby Allen here because he's an enigma without question. So, uh, anyway, I'm glad he's doing well. I know you're staying busy. Hey, when is, uh, is our, a little round table with Bischoff and Bruce or not Bruce, Bruce, I wish he was that been there. Tony Bischoff, me and you, is it going to be soon? Yeah. It's live right now at adfreeshows.com. Well, I can't, I can't, uh, Hype, nothing more. We had so much fun that night. We did. It was, we laughed and laughed. If you're looking for comedy uh, on regarding what we do for a living and what we've done and some of our experiences and, and see uh, four guys who just, who are just hanging out, having a, having a pop and enjoying it. I hope it doesn't come down to this. Well, it was good, but they were all drunk. No, we weren't all drunk. Conrad was drunk. Oh my gosh. This thing is <laughs> no kidding. But we had a lot of, we had a, we had a blast. Yeah. We had food and we had booze and we had stories. Yep. That's all what it takes. More, what more do you need at free nation? Get after it. So hope you check it out. And, and I, and I, 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 I'm, I'm so excited about, uh, looking at it. How long is it? Uh, you know, I hadn't checked the runtime. But uh, I skipped around a little bit, and uh, the picture quality is good. Of course, Dave Silva was our cameraman that day, and uh, I think people are going to really dig it. Dave Silva was happy because he had all the food he could eat. Yes. Like you and I, we were very ecstatic about the food supply. But we had, uh, did we have some uh, we had Chick-fil-A? We had some Chick-fil-A and some BLTs. If you got chicken, if you got fried chicken and bacon, what Jim Roth is going to be fine with you. I'm good. I really am good. I'm really good about that. Uh, so anyway, it was fun. But we'll, uh, we'll talk about more about that at some point in time, but I, it, so many, you got so many things going on and so many projects. Hell, I couldn't remember when, when our, when our new show was going to uh, hit the airway. So now we know it's available folks. You're going to, you're going to regret not checking it out. I mean, it's, I think it's worth a subscription to the ad free network. If you just watch one show, 
Wow. Well, it's cool, man. And by the way, Conrad, you're becoming a big star on vice. I've been, uh, watching it on Thursday nights. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate you checking that out. Oh yeah. I watch every week. I watched uh, every, I watch every week. Those kids do a good job. They do great research. They spend some time and effort and energy to interview the right people. And, uh, but they, they've done a real nice job and you're the, the little, uh, the round table, uh, with those two boys are really informative. I think they, re- they answer questions. They connect the dots. Yeah. Ma- makes a lot of sense. Add some <clears throat> context to it for sure. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, that's what's on my mind. I was nothing great. Just, uh, last good, good time to be a wrestling fan. And it's probably a good time to talk about backlash 2001. I can't believe it. 20 years ago today when this one happened, of course, this is the follow-up from WrestleMania 17, which we just talked about. And, uh, it's clear the WWE has won the wrestling war. Uh, they've bought out WCW and they're not really purchasing ECW, but they've effectively inherited it. And, uh, Steve Austin, of course, famously turned heel at the end of the biggest WrestleMania ever. And unfortunately the rock has left to do a movie as well. In hindsight, this has got to be right up there with Austin's biggest regrets. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, probably in hindsight. Uh, you know, he was hell bent on it. And, uh, as we've discussed, I was, this is hell bent going the other way, but I've told you what Ben said, Jim, JR, we, he wants to do it real bad. He thinks it's going to work and we owe it to him. So I think that was, a, I, I, after I heard that explanation, I, my pushback was less. So it was a, but it was a critical time for us because first of all, in your, in your lifetime, your, your wrestling lifetime, shelf life, you're not going to have two baby faces simultaneously in your company. The, that have the impact and the star power of stone cold and the great one. You're just not, you wish you could, but you can't, those guys are not, they're naturals. They just come along every now and then. To lose them both from the baby face side of the roster in hindsight is devastating. Right. So, uh, we were to say, we, if were you guys scrambling, I'd say yes, because you can't, the two guys I've just mentioned are irreplaceable. How tough is your job here in talent relations? I mean, not only are you on the air, but now behind the scenes, you're, you're running talent relations and you've got the WWF acquiring WCW, just sifting through all of that could not have been easy, right? Well, it wasn't easy. Uh, that job was never easy before the purchase or after quite frankly, because you're managing people and everybody's got a different agenda. Everybody's got a different personality. Everybody's got different needs. Uh, and so it's never easy, but this addition to WCW made it even more challenging because you know what, what Here's what the talent's interested in knowing the same two reasons they quit or they want out creative and cash cash and creative. Well, I could handle the cash part. I'm negotiating contracts with all those cats, the creative part, I, unless I just wanted to lie to them and, and bullshit them, which was not my style, uh, that, you know, I can't help you there. Right. All, all I can say, you know, I give them the same advice I gave I give a lot of people. Don't give the company any reason to not want to do business with you. So during this transition, there are going to be some missteps. There's going to be some, you know, some issues where we're going to stumble. We're all going to stumble, but we've got to understand it's we're in it together. And hopefully the cream's going to rise to the top. And I think by and large it did. Uh, but you know, we, we just, we, we, we didn't get the full compliment of WCW guys that if we had, it would have been enormously more successful as far as the invasion and all those things, because then the invaders would have much more, uh, star power and, and steam. And we weren't able to get those guys signed for the obvious reason is the fact that they were being paid an exorbitant amount of money, which is great. And it was guaranteed and it came to their mailbox every week. So that big time mailbox money to do nothing, but let your contract continue till it expires was, uh, that was just, we couldn't avoid that. And, and nor could we compete with that Conrad. Do you remember Vince having a conversation with you about, Hey, we really need this guy. We really need that guy or, uh, Hey, take another run at that guy. 
Was there anybody that Vince really was interested in that for whatever reason, the timing just didn't work out? Well, I know that, uh, yeah, we had conversations about who's going to be available, but, but, you know, it came right back to the mathematics. What, what are the, what are the bottom line terms of their, as their contract? And, uh, you know, that was the key issue. You got guys that are all, all those guys were north of 40. They had a lot of bumps in their bodies for them to be off, have some normalcy in their life, which they had never had in their adult life. As long as they've been in this business, no normalcy as far as travel, time away from home, your loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they all have aches and pains. They all have had multiple surgeries. So, you know, I didn't think it was a bad deal. I told Ray Mysterio that I said, man, the, the, all the bumps you've taken over the years, you start when you're a teenager, 14, 15 years old, whatever it was. And now you get a chance to watch your kids grow up a little bit and, and train through any issues you got. And you're, and you're getting paid, you're getting paid more guaranteed from WCW than I can offer you. Just so you'll know, I remember talking to him back in the, in LA at, uh, I think we're at the Staples center. I think it was LA. I know it was either in Southern Cal, it was either, it was either LA or, or Anaheim, the pond, but we had a long talk that uh, one night there came up to see me and, and that's what I told him. I said, you know, I'm going to sign you. And I'm going to pay you fairly. And you're going to make so much more money than you're guaranteed that it, this won't even be a relevant conversation in a year. And uh, of course, how do they believe me? Right. You know, Ray, he'd never worked with me before, but I, I was very honest about it. You know, so in other words, if you get a better deal in Japan and it fits your schedule and you like it, then I can't match the, the WCW dollar. I can earn you more than you ever earned at WCW because here you're not on salary. You're still going old school to the point that the better we do, the more tickets we sell, the better the houses are, the more money you're going to make. So then the only th thing you and I got to converse it, about in is, uh, you know, when you need a day off, right? Cause I, if I get you on the road, I got you a chance to make a whole lot more money and that's what you're here for. So it was a all good co open conversation, business conversation, but he never, this never gave me, you know, he, he always wanted to know the update. He, he was very interested in Goldberg. I don't think he was not interested in any of those stars like flair and Hogan, sting, Nash, Scott Hall, all those guys. Uh, he was some, he was more invested in others, some others than not, but you know, uh, I think if, if I had to say one guy. For me, the one guy would have been Sting, followed by Goldberg. For Vince, it probably was Goldberg, then Sting later on. And I don't know exactly. What, I'm just I'm assuming this is somewhat accurate. It would be clickbait, as you know. Yeah. In a in a few hours, because <laughs> I said this like it was factual. So and so because it's a nice click for their, for their websites, but maybe sometimes these get these these guys should see the context of what you and I talk about before they write their headline. You might want to read the article before you write the headline, but God damn, that's a lot to ask somebody that will interrupt their push, their podcast, their, uh, website of the year awards that are very lucrative and, uh, it makes you famous, not so, but no, 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 no particular talent. We were, we were just didn't have any, there's nothing we could do about it. And that's the, I'm sure that people who listen to this are, are saying there had to be a better answer than one JR gave in that podcast. There had to be something they could have done. Yeah, we could have, we could have blown the whole damn budget out of the water and spent an enormous amount of money on, on just like I said earlier on 40 plus year old talent that have had multiple surgeries that are very content about sitting at home. I can't match your contentment. I could pay you more money if Vince wants to, he can pay you whatever he wants, but it's, it's going to upset our pay scale our, 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 the way we do things. And I wasn't for that at all. Cause I knew that once the money ran out and those weekly checks kept stopped coming, Conrad, those guys are going to be called anyway. And, and lo and behold, most of them did. Let's talk about the rumor and innuendo at the time 
allegedly the original plan that Bruce and company had in mind creatively was let's have this Austin heel turn, turn into triple H being a baby face and then they can feud. But for whatever reason, triple H didn't want to do that. He wanted to maintain his heel status. I know a lot has been said over the years about guys who preferred, I guess most talent probably prefer to be a heel, but the real money when it comes to merchandising and things of that effect, uh, that comes when you're a baby face. Do you remember Hunter being a little hesitant to embrace being a baby face? Uh, maybe a little bit, but the thing about that is I also remember him getting some mighty fat royalty checks when he was a heel selling merchandise. Okay. And I think that was just Conrad. What you said is accurate, but more so accurate in another generation than it was here in 2001. Okay. In other words, there are more heel fans that would be willing to be vocal and, and, and supply their colors, uh, than, than not. But, but what you said is accurate. But I think by 2001, it started loosening up a little bit. See, I got to throw a resting term in there. I loosened sure. up. Can't work stiff. Uh, I may work. Never mind. The, uh, well, thanks to blue chew. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with blue chew. No. Anybody ain't tried it. Don't know what you do. You can't complain about something you've never tried. And we got a great offer on blue chew right now too. I'm, I'm sure we do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have more blue chew in my house and I have cereal. Okay. Uh, it sounds like you've been busy over there. I just take it for practice. Oh, okay. You know, just to make sure I, everything still works. <laughs> my favorite Jim ism is Conrad. I got plenty of lead in the pencil. Just nobody to write to. That's right. I'm a lonely man. If you're hearing this ladies, it's at jrsbbq.com. Let's keep going here. Yeah, please do. Uh, seven I'm, bur I'm burying my fat ass. Will you? Let me get these shovels out. 7.41 million viewers turn into the raw after WrestleMania. This historical raw is also the first one without nitro since what? 95. It draws a 5.67 rating. It's up against the Duke Arizona national championship game that drew a 15.6 rating. But this is the most amount of people that have ever watched a show on TNN in the history of the network. Woo. Boy, this was the best of times right here. Was it not? Yeah, man. Well, you know, like it was like uh, the first week that AEW went on a post on Wednesday night and we, we popped a big number. Yeah. Uh, and the same thing here, we were unopposed coming off WrestleMania. So, uh, uh, we're, we're, we celebrate as we should have are 1.2 million viewers. And we're very proud of that number. And it's a healthy number. It's the second most watched cable show of the night of any show on cable, but you just named the number 7.41 million viewers. Crazy. Yeah. It's just, so that's how good it was as much as WWE celebrated how much, uh, the NXT show did unopposed how well we did on Wednesday unopposed. Uh, and we're, and those numbers are great. They rank well, as we said, but this showed 7.41 million viewers. That's healthy. It's a different time, uh, when where raw after WrestleMania wasn't hijacked, you know, in more recent years, the raw after WrestleMania, you had all these fans from all over the world, not just the country, but all over Europe and Australia and everywhere in between. And they had their favorites and they were ready to chant and sing. And it was a good time, but this is more of a normal show, but it's a little weird in that now Austin's a bad guy and we haven't seen that in years at this point, but he doesn't get the big heel reaction because nobody really wants to boo him. No, well, he didn't get over the heel and, and, uh, you're right. It's simple as that. The fans rejected that piece of creative. Uh, their love for Austin that was deep rooted was much stronger than, uh, what he did with, with rock and McMahon and the Astrodome. Uh, Austin was truly the most over guy I can remember seeing in my career as a baby face. And I'm not, well, he's knocking this guy. He's knocking that guy. I can't miss folks. I can't mention everybody. I can't mention all your goddamn heroes. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not knocking Hulk Hogan. He was over. He was start. He pulled the wagon. He pushed the thing out and got it, got it rolling. 
but Austin was the most over bevy face. And I did a lot of studies on Mert sales when I, when I was in that office, uh, he was selling merchandise that was unprecedented of any era by any talent. And, uh, one reason was because of that was that he designed most of his own t-shirts and he had a new product coming out all the time. Right. He was a marketer. It's much like your ad free network or right, the ad free networks growth is exponential. And one of the reasons it's so popular is because of the diverse amount of programming that you and your people continue to add to it. So, uh, but, but Steve, that, that, that thing just, they thought it was, I think some people thought, well, maybe it's just a phase and it, we did everything we could, to, you know, as we will talk about here to, to get him established as a heel, but I, I told him this before and it's an old story, you know, nobody wants to see John Wayne as a Nazi. That's right. He, he, he got over in this role and let's just leave it at that. But we were, you know, Steve wanted to change. He felt like his, here's what I, here's what I think in hindsight. I think he realized his list of adversaries was running thin. And so let's change, let's get ahead of the curve. Yep. Make, make me a villain so I can work with a bunch of different baby faces. But you know, we didn't have the baby faces on that side really to, we didn't have a baby face over so strong that they would prefer to see that baby face win over heel Austin. It, it almost feels like, uh, it was a checkers move rather than a chess move. You're thinking about one move ahead, which is, Hey man, I don't have a bunch of heels. Well, I'll just switch to, or I'll just switch the other side. Maybe I'll just fight the baby faces, but there's not a huge list there either. I just no. don't know that we got that far down, but he had a hell of a baby face that night, the night after WrestleMania it's rock and Austin in a cage match a rematch for the world title. That leads to Triple H coming out and helping Austin retain, and they just beat the shit out of the rock. So now you've got the two biggest heels put together with Vince, and there's no baby faces. As that show comes to a close, that very first Raw after WrestleMania, do you remember yourself or Austin or Vince or anyone saying, Oh shit, what now? Yeah, I, I remember saying we got work to do. Yeah. You know, we, we, for whatever reason, Perhaps it would fit in the category of overthinking something. Maybe, uh, we devalued how over we all got stone cold and how over stone cold got himself over, but it was a collect, it was a team effort. All the graphics, the merchandise, the whole package was uh, very, uh, Austin oriented in our company at that time. So, and I think we've sometimes, did we just forget this shit? You know, he, he, they love this guy. So, you know, and so the old deal was maybe we've got to take a step or two back and get some heels on a roll. See who gets over the quickest, the best. And then match those guys, that person or people up with Steve, but there was no patience. It's, it's not unlike, you know, Vince and his dad even. Before him, especially his dad, they had a heel factory. Right. Because they had a baby face territory. I'm sure you've heard Bruce talk about this baby face territory at WWE. And, and people say, well, how do you determine that? Well, you determine that by the fact that go all the way back to Bruno and he's a champion for nine years. Skip forward a little bit and you got Bobby Backlund, who was a champion for five or six years, whoever it was. Uh, somebody's going to say, well, JR wasn't five or six years. It was, 413 days and 12 hours to that. I say to you, Mr. Critic, kiss my Oklahoma ass. Come on. Long time. Bret Hart, great baby face, great champion. Uh, Randy Savage, baby face champion. And I know they had some heel runs, but basically speaking, the WWF was a baby face territory. And we broke the, we broke that chain trying to do something different. And, the, and that's, that's been a big fault to a lot of promoters over the years is yeah, the ones we talked about the territories got good feedback too, that we talked about the territories and why they went out of business. Uh, you know, it, you, you gotta change things. You gotta change things up, but you don't blow up your basic formula, good versus evil. Leave that alone, but 
recast your good and recast your evil or, and, and make sure that the, the evil guys have got a chance to beat the good guys. If you have that, those odds are in the villain's favor. They got a shot. This is a bad dude. I don't know if oh, Stone Cold can handle this guy. He's a different breed of cat, blah, blah, blah. Now I got something to store to tell, but we didn't take the patience or the time to do that. And, uh, I think we just missed, we overshot how over Steve was. I mean, he was over, I mean, undershot how, how over he was. Let's talk about the next night in SmackDown. It's Oklahoma city. You've told this story before, but well, for a long time, it felt like if raw or SmackDown, if they were TV in Oklahoma city, Jr. would have an angle. And this is no exception. <laughs> no. That's what right. Jr. would interview Austin in the big angle. Austin's explanation was that he needed Vince as an insurance policy because he wasn't going to lose at WrestleMania. He said he doesn't care about the fans because he never cared about the fans. Ross asked how he could align himself with the guy who tried to run him over. And Austin said he wants somebody that's sick on his side. Ross talked about being there when he got out of surgery and he and his wife being the only guests at his wedding. And Austin knocked off the hat and glasses and dared JR to hit him. JR walks away and Austin jumps him. Austin beat on Ross until he juiced and then he hit him out. Ross went out on a stretcher. Woof. This is some old school heat here, and unfortunately, we're on the uh, receiving end of it. I had a lot of juice that night. And it, I didn't do the old Ted DiBiase Mid South uh, routine where I took a handful of aspirins and drank a couple shots of, of uh, liquor. That's the old school way of getting a lot of, when you do the heavy duty TV juice angle, sometimes guys would take their aspirin and, and maybe just on TV, but certainly big house shows. But where heavy juice was needed, sometimes guys would thin their blood a little bit by taking aspirin. Like you and I do, Conrad, every morning. I take a baby aspirin. <laughs> I don't plan on getting juice. Up on that. Huh? It, the, the, that day, did you do this yourself or did you have a little help with it? With, with the blood? No, I didn't yes, do sir. nothing. No, I just laid there, let Austin cut me. Okay. With a scaffold. He didn't use a regular blade. Somebody gave him the bright idea that these scaffolds would, uh, would cut cleaner, not as many jagged edges, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't quite sting as much, which is bullshit. And, uh, you know, getting cut like that was like getting stung by a couple of bees. It doesn't kill you, but it, you can, it hurts. It's startling. Right. It's an, it's a feeling you never experienced that often. You know, I didn't sit around my house when I was a kid, want to be a wrestler and practice getting juice. Oh, Why man. didn't you, JR? God damn it. Aren't you not dedicated anymore? Don't you care? Are you that old? You're not care about a hurricane Ronas and Tope El Suicidas, you son of a bitch. So anyway, he hit, he got me with a scaffold and, uh, it was bad enough to do stitches, but oh. uh, the doctor there, uh, was convinced to glue it shut. So they glued my cut shut. It's right over here. I think somewhere in this neighborhood. If you ever, if you ever meet me and you're close enough and you ask me, I'll show you my, my big, uh, red badge of courtesy is. Yeah. I got some juice that night in the main event. Raiders were great. Sold out, turned away. I didn't ever see some people. <laughs> uh, and all oh, I went over to, by the way, I had to go over. Whose idea was it? To, uh, hey, let's make sure they boo him. Let's beat up the hometown boy. Is this, uh, Vincent KM King? baby? Yeah. He's driving the bus when oh. somebody that's, I understand why you asked me that question. It's a good question. It's a logical question, but all those, that level decision to go that graphic, you know, when is the last time a TV broadcaster has ever been that deeply involved in your top angle that includes the the broadcaster getting cut like a pig. It don't happen. No. So, uh, and I, and I will tell you that Steve had some attention, you know, the interesting story about that. I, I may have told the story, you know, we are trying to figure out a way to, you know, for people to take their eyes off stone cold and, and me long enough for Steve to do his business. And that was the diversion. We needed a diversion. So I suggested. It should be Vince. He's the one that's orchestrating this, all this craziness. 
He's the one that Austin's aligned with. So he comes out on the stage and, and if you go back, back and watch this segment, uh, for those that care to, you'll hear, you'll hear see Vince come out and he says, open him up, all that phlegm and shit, open him up. And so, uh, while people are looking back at Vince on the stage by the Titan Tron and all that stuff and open him up, he opened me up. <laughs> And so, you know, like I said, it stung by, it stung like a bunch of damn bees. And I wasn't, I never experienced that kind of pain. It wasn't like pain, like in insurmountable. And some of the boys that are listening to this, and I know a lot of the boys listen, they're probably going to laugh my ass, their asses off because they do it all the time. Right. But did you do it with a scaffold? I think you did it with a razor blade. There's a big difference, pal. So, uh, in any event, uh, it, this came out, did his distraction. Steve did his business. And I knew it was bad when I raised my head up and the people in the crowd finally got a look because it was that gasp. Yeah. Feel it. You feel the air go out of the building. Uh, oh, oh no. You know, that type of deal. Yeah, especially my little bride. God bless her. Heaven. She wasn't uh, happy with this. Uh, she thought we went too far. Yeah. Honey, don't you think you went too far? <laughs> well, I wasn't in a position to negotiate, honey. Right. Well, no, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what they want. I said, I did, and I said the same thing to her. It's told me, honey, I did it for Steve. I did it for Steve. And that took a little bit of the heat off of me, but, uh, it was a tense moment at the house as, as I said, uh, on that thing, you know, I forgot that Jan and I were the only two wrestling people that invited to this wedding. Yeah. To Deborah. This makes it even cooler. Makes it let's, even cooler. Let's mention after this, we would see Triple H pin Jericho to win the Intercontinental title. So now your world champion is Steve Austin. Your Intercontinental champion is Triple H. The two biggest heels in the promotion have both of the singles titles. Yeah. Around this same time, too, we want to remind you Jerry Lawler is no longer with the company. Paul Heyman is in his old seat. And he went on Wrestling Observer Live and stated that you had called him and invited him back, but not Stacy Carter. Is that how you remember it? Yeah. I, I called to see how he's doing and let him know that there's a, you know, this, I discussed this, you know, was Jerry, Jerry left in protest. I still don't believe that Stacy, what Stacy Carter's attitude was a meritus of her getting canned. That came from some writers or and producers or in that world saying she was very difficult to work with. They caught Vince on a bad day. And so she's gone. There was no long talk as well. Let's think about it. Let's, let's, let's review this next week or, or let's, when we get back off the road. Let's sit, let's have a little chat. Boom. Done. So, uh, but I, I would check on Jerry, you know, he's my friend. He got, he, he's not there working, but. That's the thing about wrestling is people have a real funky perception of people leaving and going and God for God knows WWE just let go of a lot of good talent. And I'm sure that there are talents that are still in WWE that are still friends with those that got cut. Why wouldn't they be, you know, it's not like you're, you're, you're worried about exchanging trade secrets. Right. So, uh, but Stacy wasn't welcome back at that point in time, unfortunately. Fair or not fair, it's business, and that's the way it went down. So, uh, but uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry needed, you know, he was out of the loop, and he'd been the, been there for all that time. He just missed the biggest WrestleMania ever. You know, he's not his luck's not going great right now. He's getting plenty of work. He hell, he gets plenty of work now. He's still wrestling, uh, pretty much every weekend. So, uh, any, 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 any event, Conrad, I think, uh, I just want to keep in touch with him. Let him know I was thinking about him, nothing else, uh, for what that's worth. I'm a, that's what friends do. That's what I think friends do. So if I did, if I was screwing up there, then that's my bad. It's my instincts. You state in the Ross report that interpromotional angles between the WWF and WCW would have to be developed, but that would happen much later down the line because rebuilding WCW must happen first at this point, do you recall there being a plan of, okay, 
We're going to do a Saturday night slot or a so-and-so slot. We're going to call that our WCW show. And then eventually we'll get there. Was that the original plan? If we had gotten the complete roster, everybody that we wanted, then there would have been an entirely different game plan. Uh, but we didn't. So we had to kept changing on the fly and, uh, you know, uh, Vince just was not happy. Uh, that competitive edge in him, he just was not happy with, he wasn't blown away by any of the talents that we brought in. I think I was probably highest on Booker T and I thought Booker was going to be a great addition to our team. And he was, he's in the hall of fame now. And, uh, but Booker had not been managed correctly. And I'm not knocking his booking, just Booker's story of having a brush with the law and going to prison had never been told. And here's why that's a good story. It's a human interest story. People can relate to the others that have got knocked to their knees. The question then, did he get back up? How'd that work out? Or did he not get back up? Did he go back on the same road? And Booker T rehabilitated himself. He's got a beautiful family. He's got a good business. He does some podcasting and he does all he's got a, still got, I guess he's still got a school. So, and he's trained a lot of talents. So Booker T is a success story. I said, man, you need to tell that story. And he'd started using some of that stuff in w, WWE and, and then WWE, the writers are smart enough to, 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 uh, uh back it up and use it in storylines. So. But the, pro, the the whole process was, it would change by the day. So the original plan was on this date, we were going to do this. It never existed. And anybody that tells you it did, uh, kept it secret apparently, because I sure as hell don't remember anything like that. It changed by the day. It seemed like, and that's what got really, really frustrating. You think it's frustrating for us. The talents had no clue what they're going to do until they got to TV. And sometimes when they, by the time they got to TV, we didn't know what they were going to do yet. So it was a real tumultuous time, as I mentioned earlier, and, uh, one that I'm glad I don't ever have to go through again in that regard. Coming off your angle on raw with Austin, we, um, we see the new TV. So I guess the, the attack happened on SmackDown, but we're going to see you busted up and bruised up here on raw. It seems like you're stuck in a room with Vince and. He's forcing you to rewatch your SmackDown segment. And you mentioned you could always quit and go to work for Shane at WCW, which was part of the storyline at this point. Right. And, and they show a clip at one point where the blood is literally spurting from your forehead. Well, you could never show that these days, but my goodness, it just drives home in case you missed it. Just how brutal the attack was. It was real. You know, it's, uh, it was. It was, it was a unique angle based in fact, and based in reality, because people knew that Steve and I were close and we had a, a friendship that went way beyond wrestling still does to this very day, by the way, you must keep the score at home, but it got very graphic. I have not heard. And I told, I kidded Steve about this. I said, have you, did you ever use that a scaffold after that? No. Oh, so I was the Guinea pig that night. On television, I remember him hitting me so hard. I get, we got in the back after they carted me out and, you know, the boys are standing around clapping, you know, JR took one for the team and, you know, Vince is so proud, <laughs> you know, it loves the misery of others. So, uh, I said to Steve, I said, what was that? Well, that shit, you beat the shit out of me. What the fuck? Well, you, you pissed off about a payoff or what's going on? He says, had to make it look good kid on television. I said, it's taped, Steve, it's taped. They could edit around anything that's bad. It's taped. I said, I got fucking knuckle knocks. Your goddamn big old hands all over my head, my forehead. He got, he was in the, if you go back and look at that, slow it, do some slow motion. You'll get, you'll see what I'm saying. He, he laid his shit in. I, I preach that all the time. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander, as they say. But, uh, we, we've laughed about that many times, you know, heavy hands. I've even got, I'll call him heavy hands, especially if we're drinking a hey, heavy hands, pass me a beer. <laughs> Hold my beer. This is, uh, the same episode where Linda announces she's filing for divorce on raw. 
How was Linda as an uh, on-screen performer? We've spent a lot of time talking about how great Stephanie was as a heel. Everybody knows how great uh, Vince was and, of course, all the crazy stunts that Shane became known for. What about Linda as an on-screen performer? Very reliable, sweetheart of a woman. She should be sainted. Uh, you know, she's just uh, the life she's lived, of course, is amazing now, but it wasn't always living on a thread day to day, uh, in the family business, but it's extra pressure on you. I never had a bad, uh, I never had a bad conversation. I never had a bad meeting with, with Linda at once. And we had to meet about some very controversial and, and daunting tasks, daunting subjects, death, courts, walkouts, all these things. And so she was uh, perfect. Was she the greatest actor? I don't, well, I don't know how that's subjective. I don't know how, what was the greatest non-wrestling uh, performer we had. And even she would take a bump or two every now and then. I just found her to be very, very cooperative. And even though it's like, I remember that we, we may have talked about this in one of our podcasts about the, when I got fired in Waco. Yeah. And she kicked me in the balls. Yep. Uh, she didn't really want to do that. And so, uh, I just said, oh, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. Just, you know, we're just going to have fun and, you know, you'll be cool. But she didn't want to do it. She said, you know, the accident or whatever. And, but she was, she's always sensitive in that regard. So I, I look at Linda McMahon as being one of the finest women I ever knew and and worked with certainly by far. Let's talk about the uh, other piece of business on TV here. We see triple H Stephanie and Austin team up to take on the Hardys and Lita, which winds up with uh, Lita pinning Stephanie after a moonsault and Austin absolutely killed Lita after the match with chair shots and stunners. This is a lot, Jim. I mean, I understand we're trying to get him over as a heel. Mm -hmm. He beat up an announcer on Thursday and there's blood everywhere on Monday. He's destroying ladies with chairs. This is a lot. We were trying too hard, Conrad, obviously we're pulling out all the stops. There was nothing that we wouldn't, we weren't willing to do seemingly anyway, uh, to help Steve get over as a villain, but no matter what we did, beating up his good old buddy, the chubby announcer and leaving him a bloody mess, uh, taking one of the most popular females. Uh, ever on the roster in Lita and then, and then nailing her the chair shots and the stunners and all that stuff. Uh, nothing was, was off limits apparently, but it's trying too hard. We realized early on that we were swimming upstream and it was going to be very daunting to get Steve to the position that he wanted to be as the top heel. And the top heels, but you got to remember, Conrad, we've talked about this too before here. The heels, heel qualities include having enough heat on them that you will pay your money to drive to the arena to watch them get their ass whipped. Right. So I just checked all the boxes of what, why it wasn't going to work. Nobody's going to pay their money to come to raw or whatever house show live event or your, whatever you want to call it and beat, uh, and see Austin get his ass whipped. They're not mad at him as much as they probably were uncomfortable with my little angle or stuff like the, the leader situation. They still weren't angry enough at Steve to turn on him. And there was, so what else, what else could we do? If you, if you're in my position or you got a, you're sitting next to the chairman on most days, what do you do? What would you do? If he says, we're going to go with this and we're going to do all we can to make Steve a, a villain. We didn't have a cutoff date. Well, if we don't get it done by SummerSlam, we'll, we'll right, wash our hands of it and move on. Conrad, there's no, there's no way, there's no way out. There's right. no right answer to that question. I just asked you, what would you do? I don't know. It's uh, pretty remarkable that this all happened the way it did. We should mention, uh, triple H, uh, is going to, uh, lose the intercontinental title to Jeff Hardy on the SmackDown right after this raw. Yep. Is there thought here that the Hardys individually could be these baby faces we were looking for? Jeff Hardy. 
Okay. Jeff Hardy was earmarked that he might really be, uh, had the potential to get over as a single baby face spinning out of his outstanding tag team with Matt. Uh, by the way, Matt's match with Mr. Darby Allen earlier, that uh, false count anywhere match that Matt had with Darby on AAW that night was premium work, yes. premium work. So Matt still got a ton of gas in his tank, but Jeff was younger. He appealed more to the females. It seemed, and the younger guys, he, he, he checked his boxes also. So that was the hope of that situation. I think that's, I don't know where this fell, Conrad, in the match he had with The Undertaker on television, where I said, climb the ladder, kid, to make yourself famous. Right. We really tried hard to get Jeff over. Uh, and I think if he had had some, his little demons running crazy in his head, that we would accomplish that. It just wasn't in the cards, unfortunately. But he got a big win and won a title, but uh, it was short lived. Let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, Kevin Dunn. It makes the newsletter that it's you and Kevin Dunn who are being put in charge of figuring out this WCW roster and front office staff. Is that the way you recall? Yeah. Well, Kevin Dunn, uh, who's still there doing a hell of a job. Uh, I, I, uh, had a lot of fun working with Kevin over the years because we're both big football fans and most of our conversations had nothing to do with wrestling or WWE or whatever. It was a lot more just about football and shit we like to talk about. But he was Vince's number one guy in television. And JR was Vince's number one guy in talent. And Vince always said that talent and television are the two key components to, for our company to be successful. So uh, he just picked us two got top guys and had confidence that we could kind of muddle through these things. It, it just wasn't, you weren't really sure. The other thing that makes it tough, Conrad, is that here's a bunch of guys that we're going to bring in and we know that their motivation is to get a job and get paid. How many of them really want to be here? How many of them aren't burnt out? How many of them are ready to regroup, hit the restart button? And that you can't, you can't, you can't get that in a, in a computer survey or a tweet or a text or a drag here, click there, check this son of a bitch. Uh, you got to work with them. But, I, but Kevin and I, you know, that's where I hired Lauren Itis as an agent or my assistant, actually assistant in talent relations. Uh, I hired Finley and all these guys as agents uh, and, and they were good. And I still think the world, all those dudes, but, uh, Kevin and I, that was our charge to put a plan together to present to Vince. We were not going to go in business for ourselves. That's not what he wanted. He wanted to plan. He wanted to plan on how the TV was going to be handled, edited, taped a plan for what talents we're going to try to utilize. Is this your most stressful time in the, in the company where you're trying to wear both hats and there's so many moving parts? I mean, we don't talk about it, but you got the XFL, you got WCW, uh, <laughs> now, and you're doing the on air stuff and talent relations with all the WCW stuff. It just, it feels like it's gotta be up there with the most stressful times of your career. I think it led to, I think it, uh, What's well, one of my issues about Bell's palsy is that, you know, every neurologist that I've been to see will tell you all universally that there's no, there's no known cause. There's no known cure for Bell's palsy. It's a, it's a facial nerve thing. And most people get over it in about 90 days. We well, you know I've had it three times. I think that part of my issue was they say, well, if, Guess on what causes Bell's palsy we would say it was either virally uh, tr transmitted like of some kind of virus or it's a uh, stress. And I kind of go with the latter. I didn't, I internalized way too much. Conrad, my job never ended. It was a seven day a week gig. People say, oh, bullshit. That's impossible. I can't do that. Well, 
I can tell you the days. I know where I was going to be on Monday. I knew where I was going to be on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, when we got back in the office, I was going to get turned. I was going to finish my payroll that I started on Monday or Tuesday and turn that in. So the town could be paid on Friday. And then on Thursday, we had meetings because I was a department head and on the executive committee. And cause we had to fit our schedule now with the other members of the executive committee for these various meetings. Uh, and then we started back on a house show run on Friday. I booked the house show cards. So that was getting with all well, getting with the, the lead agent in both those markets and going over the show order of events, finishes everything. And then on Sundays, it, it was either travel to raw every four weeks to a pay-per-view or then maybe that rare occasion where you actually are home, which didn't happen that often. So yeah, it was by far the busiest time of my life and I didn't handle the stress. Well, I should have done in hindsight, I would have delegated more, but it's just a matter of trust and maybe my own ego wanting to protect my turf. I'm not sure, but I, I would have, I would have been a little bit more, uh, I've been a little bit more willing to delegate and have time to exhale and actually spend more time being a husband, which I didn't do a lot. Let's talk about WrestleMania for a minute. I want to circle back because it's not too long after the show and you start to get some preliminary buy rate numbers and you realize this is the biggest show we've ever freaking done. And you probably thought that going in, but given all that's going on with WCW and the XFL, and now here, you know, there's the great success of WrestleMania. Are you able to celebrate that at all? Or is there too much going on where there's no time for attaboys? No time for attaboys. If they, if you did, they were like ships passing in the night. Good job. Thanks. Good job for you. Ditto. Uh, no, because you don't go into reruns, right? You don't have an off season. It's fresh. It's a fresh premier premieres every week. That may be, uh, oxymoronic. Uh, but nonetheless, you know what I'm saying? First run television. So, and the payroll never stopped. It's not like you said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to take one week off on the payroll. Here's what that would have meant. Every talent on the roster would not have gotten a paycheck that week. And if you're trying to make ends meet, you got family obligations, uh, you can't, it can't be done. You can't do it. It's not, it's not an option whatsoever. So, uh, the, the meter kept running. I felt like a gerbil on a treadmill. My little fat ass was running all the time. Hell, if I'd eat right, got better nutrition, uh, I probably would have weighed about buck 85, like ninth grade again. <laughs> Let's talk about SmackDown for a minute. We just talked about the record rating that you're going to have on Raw, where it's the most people ever who'd ever seen a TNN program. But just a few weeks after WrestleMania, we have a record low on SmackDown. Is that strictly based on the Austin heel turn? Or do you think that creative is just for lack of a better word, burn out? I think both those reasons, uh, could be used in a court of law. Uh, you know, the Austin thing just changed the dynamic, you know, just changed the dynamic. You know, it's like having a, a, a great, uh, uh, a hitter in baseball. And all of a sudden he decides he don't want to bat anymore. He's going to be a pitcher. It changes the complexion of your team, of your lineup, or the, the other teammates. So I think that was a big issue, but to say where they burned out, you know, I don't know how they could not have been, and that's not a knock on creative. You take away two great players, two great stars, et cetera, et cetera. We talked about that ad nauseum. Uh, it, it's hard for them to come up. Okay. Give me somebody over like rock. Right. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. That's like replacing you, Conrad. It can't be done. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, let's well, talk. S Silva says he can, but you know how Bill Ramos is when he starts drinking that fire water. He's full of shit. We know that. 
<laughs> so Triple H does win the Intercontinental right back from Jeff Hardy on the next draw. I know you've been critical of sort of flip-flopping the title around, but was yep. this always the plan? Just, hey, let's just try it, see what happens, see if we can get a little steam on him. Uh, and then go from there. I guess uh, in Vince's mind, it was to give uh, Jeff the rub. We'll get with that win on uh, SmackDown with Triple H. But he didn't get rubbed enough. He didn't get rubbed in the right spots to make it last. So, uh, I don't know why we did that. I could have seen us having a, you know, a non finish for that first one or, or something in the match ended in real controversy. Uh, but to have him win the title and then lose it back. I just never been a big fan of that. I, be <clears throat> I may be wrong about this Conrad. I believe it's half-assed lazy booking to have rematches from a Sunday night pay-per-view on a rematched on Mondays. Now, unless the finish dictates that it makes sense, but to just to get one more out of it, cause we've got all this time and TV invested in it. Uh, I think that's overstated too. Sometimes, well, we got all this TV type, we've got this angle and just can't have one off. No, you can have them in the house shows you can, or you can let it rest for a while and rekindle it cause the issue was never settled. So, but, uh, I, I've never been big on that, uh, rematches of a pay-per-view that the people paid money for and you get it for free the next night. Just, it's, it's just something that makes me uncomfortable. And I, might, and I might be overthinking it too. I've done that. I'll, I'll do it here today too. I'll overthink something again, other than the first 20 things I've overthought already today. What do you want me to do, Conrad? I'm red ass JR. Don't fucking Don't kiss me off. God damn it. Yeah, I'll take uh, that. Overthink. Over, overthink why we're doing this with the Hardys if there's no planned program. Like, let's sort of reset the table a little bit. We see Hunter beat Jeff Hardy or, or drop the IC to him and then eat him up in the rematch. A week before that, or maybe two weeks before that, we saw Austin just absolutely destroy Lita with chairs. But there's no, like, planned program. And, in fact, even when Triple H beats him up, uh, in the match here, they don't even show the finish. The shot is instead on Lita and Austin on the ramp and you just totally miss the finish. So I'm sure Vince was having an aneurysm about that with the truck, but <laughs> the idea that we're doing something with the Hardys, but there, it's not like the show we're building. To in our action talk about here momentarily. It's the Hardys. I'm just, I'm having trouble connecting the dots. Well, try working there. Yeah. I try and it herd the chickens. I'm with you. I, I understand your, your consternation. I feel it. I felt it. I lived it, but that's just how it was. We didn't know what we wanted to do. And there's so many cooks in the kitchen and with Vince, I think Vince obviously felt he said, always had real good instincts, especially in that period regarding, uh, uh, talent getting over or not. He's not always right, but he, he, as he told me before, I got a, he said, I've got a pretty good track record. JR, we're going to go with this. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I just think we were, we were rudderless. We didn't have creative direction. We didn't know who was going to be, uh, you know, who was going to be anointed the next big thing. Uh, you know, sometimes I think triple H didn't think he was over enough that he can, he had to influence the booking to where he would win that title right back. And he would be very, very dominant in doing so when uh, a hell of a match and, and making, making Jeff Hardy before Jeff Hardy loses would have been the way to go, obviously in hindsight. But I think that's just a talent that, uh, had fought his whole, you know, look, he, triple H had been sitting at the, he, he never got to sit at the head table. Lumber's right. Rock and Austin were there. He's not going to stop those guys are longer, you know, as, as featured. And the boys could see that no matter how hard Steve wanted to get over as a heel and try this, this crazy experiment and make it work, the boys could see it too. And Triple H being one of the smarter guys ever in the locker room, booking wise, instinct wise, he knew where he knew that he, he, he was, he was going to get a shot. 
You know, I've, I've said this all the time. He, he would have been a great baby face. But that's what we had turned him in and go full time. A good baby face. When he came back that, that one time after that one surgery, I think of the quad surgery in the garden. If you remember that pop he got oh, returning. Huge. Unbelievable. Yeah. People were ready to love him. Fans are ready to embrace Triple H and love him on that night. And that night would have been an amazing launching pad to make him the next big thing, baby face, face wise. Didn't happen. At the next SmackDown, we see Undertaker and Kane beat Edge and Christian to become tag champs. And then Triple H and Austin would destroy Kane outside the ring. But Taker is still able to defeat Edge and Christian to win the tag titles. So now we've got a pay per view set. It's going to be the. Uh, the brothers, Kane and Taker against uh, Triple H and Austin. We're now just a few weeks removed from WCW shutting down. As a reminder, uh, that show, the very last Nitro, got a 2.6 rating. So between Raw and Nitro that night, it means 8.5 million people were watching the Monday Night War. Do you think Vince's expectation was all 8.5 are going to switch the channel and come over? Or do you subscribe to the Eric Bischoff theory that there is some duplication in that number with fans being counted twice? As absolutely a duplication. I agree with Eric. And Vince is not unlike any other promoter. You want the biggest slice of the pies you can get. And so you're just hopeful that you get whatever's there. But it's almost unrealistic to think that the audiences are going to automatically transfer, uh, quite frankly. Let's, uh, let's mention one name and then we'll jump into the show. Johnny Valentine passed away on April 24th. I'm sure we've got some younger listeners who maybe don't know much about Johnny Valentine other than, well, that must be Greg's dad. Right. Any interesting Johnny Valentine stories you can share with us? Well, the toughest man alive, uh, great respect from everybody. And you can see his mindset and how he positioned pro wrestling as his job, his art form in his own mind by watching how he threw those, uh, big forearm clubbing blows on the back or a chop or a stomp, the basic fundamental things that a rugged heel would do. JV did with amazing, uh, snugness. And he was always known as that. And the reputation for Johnny Valentine was if you have to give him time to get over because he works a very methodical style. So, uh, and if you give him time, he'll get over and he, and that never failed. He got over pretty much everywhere he worked as a top guy. So, uh, but one of the toughest, physically toughest guys in the business never was a lack for work. Always came into a territory in a top spot because he could make any baby. If you finally in a program navigated the Valentine waters, at the, you come out on the other side, much, much better and over JV would get you over, but it, you're going to pay the price. You're going to come out there with your chest, all red bruises. He's going to beat the shit out of you. And I can only imagine what some guys I see in the business today, if they had to work with Johnny Valentine, they'd call their agent or their moms and, and get them a tag out. Cause he was a bad dude, man. He's like working with Wahoo. You know, if you're going to work with Wahoo Conrad, I see that headdress up there. Is that Wahoo's headdress? It is. Yes, sir. See there. Nice segue. And you can be yours too, ladies and gentlemen, for only $5,000. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm being facetious, obviously. Uh, but, but JV was just extraordinary. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say a bad thing about him as it relates to being uh, an okay worker. His style of how he worked was very unique. And in today's marketplace with today's, uh, newer fans, they may not have had the patience or had the patience, uh, to allow him to get over. But once he, once he, he struck land and he lowered his, he, he dropped his anchor. He's a star. So, uh, one of the greats of all time, no doubt. Let's get to backlash all state arena, Chicago, April 29th, 2001. We've got 15,592 fans paying an incredible $831,510. Uh, 
uh, another 144,000 in merchandise. It's the 18th show in a row, which is a sellout for Chicago in the WWF. Uh, Chicago is almost like the capital of wrestling here in America. Would you agree? Yeah, it's a great city. Great city. You know, uh, AEW has got a pay-per-view coming to Chicago this later on this year. I think we got a dynamite there that same week. It's going to be a big week for us in Chicago. Uh, so I, I agree. Chicago sold me in February, 1989 when, uh, Ric Flair lost the NWA title to Ricky Steamboat and our pal Dave Meltzer's on the front row with the, uh, what's that, that fullback's name that played in Chicago, Brad Muster. So, uh, I don't remember it because of Dave and Brad. I remember it because of Steamboat and Rick, they killed it. But you saw the passion and the true love and the uninhibited nature of, uh, of Chicago fans. It's extraordinary. And it's still that way. I think it's almost like a rite of passage. It's in their DNA or something, or they've gone as kids and saw these big crowds that we've talked about in Chicago. And I think they just kind of feel it's their duty to continue the tradition of being the best fans in America. Let's jump right into it. Um, you know what, before we do, let's talk about where we are year over year, the year prior backlash was in Washington and you had 19,000 fans there. Uh, that's the 2000 backlash. The buy rate there was 750,000 buys here though, in 2001, it's down to 375,000 buys. It's really hard to reconcile that where you're talking about we just set every record there was with WrestleMania 17, and now we're down nearly half of where we were the prior year. Just for numbers sake, just over a million is the number you get for WrestleMania 17. And, and here, you know, what, four weeks later, 375,000 buys. Is it just, we didn't have the right main event. People were just that upset about Austin or the show's just too close together. I think, uh, again, not straddling the fence. I think it could be, a, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Primarily it's that we didn't have the attraction that the fans wanted to see coming off that great WrestleMania. We had nothing to follow it with that even came close to rock and Austin. Uh, sex of the, and I also think that, so I think that's the number one reason creative. We didn't give the fans what they wanted to see. And they showed us by 375,000 buys. And I also think that, uh, um, uh, it, how much disposable income can, is it, is available for a family, right? WrestleMania was uh, up priced and gross a lot of money. So you wonder in this length of time from WrestleMania to backlash, if people have a chance to get back on their feet for an entertainment entity, for an entertainment product, it's not like you can get on the Peacock network now and for four ninety five or whatever and watch the show. You're talking 50, 60, $70, maybe more. So I think it, the, the events coming very close together had, had something to do with it. Disposable income. We take it for granted. And, but I do think that the main thing without making any excuses, we did not have the attraction that was attractive enough, uh, to have more buys. It just didn't have the car. Didn't have the magic. Let's get into the show itself. Uh, I guess we should mention we had, we had three matches before we went live on pay-per-view. Jerry Lynn makes his TV debut on heat, winning the light heavyweight title from crash Holly in three minutes and 37 seconds. Lita would pin Molly Holly in two minutes and 40 seconds after a moonsault. And now it's time for the actual pay-per-view, which by the way, the readers of the wrestling observer only gave 33.6% thumbs up 23.7% thumbs down and 42.7% thumbs in the middle. Let's see what they were in the middle about it's X factor, which as a reminder is X Pac, Albert and just incredible. And they're going to beat the Dudleys, all of them, Bubba, Devon and spike seven minutes and 59 seconds. Meltzer didn't love it. and gave it two stars. 
but the Dudleys do their usual post-match with Devon crotching Albert and uh, Spike doing the acid drop on Credible and then 3D on X-Pac through a table to end the whole segment. But X-Factor get the win, but him and Credible land a double super kick for the finish. What do you think of this match? Uh, surprise the finish. Uh, but you know, it was executed. Okay. It wasn't too long, but I was a little surprised that they went that way with the finish, but uh, at the end of the, at the end of the night, and this is a kind of a WWE logic. We have what they got to see somebody go through a table and that would be the out. That'd be the end of the conversation. Well, I don't know if it's the right thing to do or not, but they got to see the table spot. That's what they want. That's what they came to see. And I think that's a cop out, but I do not a bad match whatsoever. Next up, we've got Rhino retaining the hardcore title, pinning Raven in eight minutes and 10 seconds. Meltzer would say this would be the only match on the show that exceeded expectations. A man actually been the best bow on the show. Uh, he would praise it saying there was a lot of creative spots here. Uh, Rhino ran up the ring steps to kill Raven on a chair, but he moved and Rhino crashed into the chair. Raven runs off the ropes and nails Rhino. They start hitting each other with garbage cans and street signs. Uh, and then comes the shopping cart, which saw a lot of 10 items or less jokes on commentary, according to Meltzer. Raven did the old drop toe hold and Rhino's face went into a shopping cart and they kill each other with hard shots uh, with these signs. And uh, unfortunately, they're hitting each other over the head with these. Uh, Rhino then gores a shopping cart and it goes right through the open. And uh, Raven pummels uh, the shopping cart with a kitchen sink. And Rhino has Rhino was nearly pinned, but finally comes back with the gore for the finish. Three and a quarter stars. Jim, uh, do you remember when Dr. Death and the Fantastics wrestled with sinks and shopping carts? This is a little different here in 2001, is it not? Yeah, Vince loves that he hit, he hit him with everything but the kitchen sink. Wait a minute. He just hit him. Uh, uh, I was pleasantly surprised this match was as good as it was. I don't know what to do. I, 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 I'll credit both guys. I mean, it ain't like Rhino and Raven are, weren't good hands. They were. But uh, they got. they also got eight minutes and 10 seconds. It gave him a little time to breathe, a little time to establish a story and, and, and move on about their business. So, uh, I was pleasantly surprised with how this match, uh, was, uh, structured and I had no issue. Got Rhino with his gore, the gore kind of got over. Heyman loved to yell gore, gore, gore. So I just let him yell gore, gore, gore and get after it. Uh, next up we've got, uh, I guess before we move on, I should ask, because we've talked about Raven recently and uh, you address the, uh, the old rumor that somebody said, who the fuck riot Raven, uh, but uh, it's Raven's best piece of business. Like he had a couple of runs here with the company, um, the real guy behind the character, but this seems like this is probably peak Raven. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's close. I can't think of thing off the top of my head that would cause me to disagree with your assessment. Uh, but the part of this conversation is answers a lot of the issues. He was inconsistent. Yeah. And so, you know, S Scott Levy never had, a, nobody could ever debate the fact he couldn't work, but he was very cerebral. I think Scotty, like a lot of us at times in our career, overthought things, made it a little bit, uh, you know, a little more cluttered than it needed to be. And then of course, uh, Sometimes his reputation didn't do him any favors, but I thought they had a nice match really better than anybody. I think it was a surprisingly good match that if you looked at it before the show and said, what do, you, what do you think would be the biggest surprise match of the night? Very few people would have said Raven and Rhino, but they, they pulled it off. Next up, something that, well, it's probably left, uh, in the book of bad ideas. William Regal pins Chris Jericho in 12 minutes and 11 seconds. And I know what you're thinking. How could this match be a bad idea? Well, it's a Duchess of Queensberry match, which means there's a lady here dressed as a Duchess at ringside doing a gimmick of changing the rules as they go along. And Dave would say the match was fine as far as work, but it got silly in a hurry where Jericho had Regal pinned after the lion salt when the Duchess signaled for the bell claiming it was the end of the first round. And then Regal gave Jericho a weird looking German suplex on his head. He used the Regal stretch, but Jericho makes the ropes. 
And then when Jericho gets on the walls and Regal's tapping, it's announced that submissions aren't allowed under the rules. You get the idea. Eventually, Regal hits Jericho over the head with the Duchess's scepter and he's DQ'd. Of course, then it's revealed that there is no DQ under these Duchess rules and the match continues. Regal finally ends up with his face and the Duchess's crotch and is doing his priceless facials. Jericho throws her into the ring, puts her in the walls, and Jericho or Regal nails Jericho with three chair shots and gets the pin. Meltzer would say from an idea standpoint, the idea of trying to directly follow this with a match requiring suspension of disbelief was very strange. Of course, he's talking about an Iron Man submission match coming up next. In hindsight, having a hardcore match and then this Queen this Queensberry rules match and then a submission match, maybe maybe it's a little much. Would you agree? Yeah, the order of matches and the place in the match is always so important, but uh, two of my favorite workers. Yes. And, and Regal and Jericho. Uh, you know, I've, always, I've said this, and I don't know how much, how much favor it gains me in the locker room at AEW, but I think Jericho's the MVP of our company. That's just my take on it. It's not knocking anybody. It's not, anytime somebody says, so-and-so is really good. Oh, ooh, wait a minute. I sense dirt. There's fucking dirt here. I'm going to find it. I'm looking for dirt. I need the goddamn dirt, Conrad. And if you don't give me the dirt, there will be nothing to unpack here. Uh, those guys are handicapped by their the structure, of this booking. And uh, not even they could pull it off. So it wasn't great. I don't like the people should know what they're buying or what they're watching. Uh, so I, I think the WWE had a match at WrestleMania, I think with Big E and uh, what's that other kid's name? He's really good. He won the match, won the title. Uh, that Nigerian drum match. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Uha Nation is what he used to wrestle as. These days, he's Apollo Crews. Yeah, good kid. Yeah. I like his work. But going into it, I remember I saw an interview that, that Big E, he's a great on promos, by the way. Uh, he didn't need somebody asking what the rules were. He didn't know. And I don't think that's good marketing. It's not, it's not Big E's fault. Somebody's got to tell him. Big E didn't book the damn match. Somebody thought it was a cute name because we can play off a cruise's Nigerian heritage. So in any event, uh, not even two of the best workers that I ever been around in Regal and Jericho could pull that one out of the fire. Next up it's, uh, Chris Benoit and Kurt angle, the Iron Man submission match, 31 minutes and 31 seconds. Uh, we talked about this with Kurt Angle, and he thought the major issue th with this match not maybe getting the reception it could have is there wasn't a scoreboard, and he felt like if it's sort of a beat-the-clock style match, uh, like it is with the Iron Man match here, you need a countdown, but you also need a scoreboard. And without that, even though you guys were explaining it to the television audience at home, it sort of killed it live. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh the, the match needed all the accoutrements that would, we would come to know later on. Kurt's right. It needed a little help uh, from the scoreboard. More, the more information the fans can receive in the basic form, the more they're apt to buy into the concept. So, uh, and I also would say I would have been very happy with just an Iron Man match. I didn't see the reason we had to limit it to submissions even though both guys use a submission for their finishers, ankle lock, cripple cross face. I get that too, but they could have used that in the body of the match, but I would have not eliminated pinfalls. I wouldn't let, wouldn't eliminate anything that was going, that wouldn't, that would have added to the match. And I think that would have, but I thought those guys, uh, you know, their work was uh, so hard, and gritty. It was good stuff, man. Next up, we've got Shane McMahon wrestling big show. It's a last man standing match. Meltzer would say there was nothing terrible about it, but aside from the bump, there was nothing much good either. Uh, McMahon's going to do three real hard chair shots to the head. 
And Meltzer says they did the old ether on a towel gimmick by Shane to put show down, but he still didn't stay down for 10. Vince then hit Shane with a chair and show gave Shane the final cut. Jack Stone gave a really slow count and big show picked him up at eight. And then he choke slammed him again. And then again, big show picks him up at eight and then show puts Shane on the torture rack. When test runs in, I guess as a designated WCW savior with a high kick. And eventually they start fighting up to the entrance area. We see Shane climb the beanstalk, which is actually the backlash set up and show went to climb, but test pulls show down. Uh, Shane gets to the top, which looked to be 29 feet high. And he says, I guess came down with an elbow on a crash pad. Shane sold the blow as well as test had to pick him up and drag him over a pipe, which he collapsed on to beat the count while show did not. They showed a million replays and that took a ton of guts to look down and jump. But the replay also showed that Shane never came close to hitting show star and a half. Well, this is just a stunt show here at this point, right? Yeah. Uh, it's also, you take away false finishes. Yeah. A lot by and large, I, I know that they're technically in a match like the last man standing and so forth. Uh, but you've got so much. No rules, chaos. Uh, I thought the, the looking at this show and looking back at it is it very stipulation heavy and maybe too much. I think we're discounting the wrestling abilities of some of those cats. Uh, but again, going back and last not having a last man standing match, it eliminates a traditional false finish. And we did that seemingly in a lot of matches and that takes some of the rhythm and some of the heart out of a, out of a, a wrestling match, eliminating the near falls. Uh, even though you technically still have getting up at eight. Okay. I get it. Well, that's a near fall. It's the shits. You can't live and die with that. And it, it takes away the traditional stuff and the things that are easiest to understand and process. So, uh, those guys too are victims of the, how the booking was done. Everybody looking for one big, you know, the Dudley's got their big shot in of their table. Everybody's looking at that one big stunt, including this here. And, you know, Shane is, uh, always, you know, I, I guess Mick Foley and Undertaker started a bad trend in June of 1998 when Taker threw take uh, Mick over the, off the cell. Because since then, pay-per-views, there's not been a pay-per-view since where there's not one match designated in the car to have a really sensational bump, a big spot, a holy shit moment. And so uh, I think maybe sometimes we put too much credence in the holy shit moments without having to put somebody's life in danger. Next up, we've got a three-way, and I kind of didn't remember this match even happened until we went back and watched it this week. Matt Hardy retains the European title over both Christian and Eddie Guerrero. They don't get a ton of time, six minutes and 52 seconds. Meltzer would say no heat, but very smooth, good wrestling. A few near falls, Edge came out and speared Matt. Jeff came out as well. Christian did the unprettier on Guerrero, and then Jeff did a swanton behind the ref's back which totally missed Christian leading to Matt using the twist of fate on Christian for the pin, uh, two and three quarter stars, three really talented guys, but three ways are probably not your favorite kind of match. Is that fair to say? Well, sometimes it depends on who's in it. Now that I was executed, that, that match got sloppy, uh, and, and guys are a little careless, you know, Jeff missing that spot didn't help it obviously. Uh, but I don't know. I don't hate three ways, but if you're just trying to outspot the next guy, you know, there's just, again, do we have an adequate amount of near falls? Do we have enough opportunities? And it doesn't always have to be the third man that breaks up the pen. That becomes very predictable. You use him if it's convenient and it makes sense. Uh, but not certainly not, uh, not just for, for spot sake, this show was holy shit spot city. Yeah. And I just think that there, we skipped around a lot. We went from a to F to G to, you know, just 
some of the logic was eliminated, basic logic. Uh, and that was unfortunate. I think it added adverse effect on the show. Let's talk about the next match here. Uh, we've got uh, the main event, Steve Austin and Triple H on one side, Undertaker and Kane on the other, and a ton of time. 27 minutes and 11 seconds. Ultimately, uh, Austin and Triple H win. And I don't know that a lot of people would have necessarily called it because as they come into this, they're the world champ and the intercontinental champ. But that's the story. Uh, and this is also an interesting twist because technically Austin's belt and Triple H's belt were on the line. Uh, so they can't lose the match. It almost feels like you paint them into a corner or just expect a DQ, but it doesn't happen. Uh, this allows Triple H to join Shawn Michaels as the only wrestler to ever hold the world title, the Intercontinental, the European, and the tag titles. And Meltzer would say they're trying to tell a story with Kane having an arm injury and Taker trying to protect him from his own guts. And so Undertaker's going to wind up taking the majority of the punishment and won't tag out. Uh, they're working on his knees, but he still won't tag. And Meltzer would say, it's scary how badly the fans still wanted to cheer Austin. <laughs> Early in the match, he would go to one corner and you could see everyone in the building on that side cheering. Kane tagged himself in and they bump for him as he does the one-armed gimmick. It gives Austin a clothesline off the top and slams Triple H off the top. I'm not saying they're not doing a good match here and telling a great story, but it does feel like the fans just don't want it this way. They really, I think they're okay with hating Triple H but they'd rather do whatever it takes to mean that Austin gets his hand raised here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was what they wanted to see. And if it had been what they wanted to see, then the buy, the buys would have been significant. Obviously. Right. I mean, Oh man, this is going to be a great card. It, even, even the card below it was strong. And there was a lot of great talent on the card, but the, the undercard of this show. They were, I don't want to tell you, they were booked as wisely in hindsight as they perhaps could have been. But in any event, uh, it just, again, reinforced that the turn wasn't working. And, you know, we had two magnificent baby faces and Undertaker being the man, the Clint Eastwood of WWF. And, uh, you know, it just, it just wasn't what they wanted to see. If the main event had been what they wanted to see, they mean the fans pronoun boy or your pronoun boy or an errand boy. I saw Dusty do that one time to Jim Barnett. Dusty says they on the floor in Raleigh, Dorton Arena. It's hotter than shit. The building's not air conditioned, but that one room is. I took Jim Barnett in there to cool off, and Dusty was laying on the floor, concrete floor, which was cool. The only thing he had on was his Johnson and Hall, Johnson and Hall. That's what they're called. Austin Hall. Austin is. Hall. Austin Hall. I just like to say the word Austin. I'm kidding. There you go. I'm an Oklahoma boy. Uh, and Dusty was laying there naked on oh. the concrete. And he was doing his Marlon Brando impersonation from uh, what's Apocalypse Now. Are you an assassin or an errand boy? Barnett says, oh, my God. Oh, my God. What's he doing? Does he do this all the time? And I said, well, you know, he's just cooling off. <laughs> what are you going to say? Right. And, my, and Mr. Barnett made a U-turn to get out of the air. He didn't want to see this scene. He told me later, he said, if everything was like that, I might change teams. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so we loaded them up. You know, you got Kane and Taker, everybody. You know, everybody believed in them. They could beat anybody. They're the brothers of destruction, et cetera, et cetera. The one caveat that it was not being sold or being bought more specifically, Conrad, was uh, the Austin situation. It just was, it, it just, everything became out of kelter. There was no symmetry to the con, the thinking process of this match. Like you said, Fans are more than happy to boo Triple H. He was a great heel. Yeah. A great heel. And, uh, but at the same respect, you know, most territories that I worked in, when you had uh, a situation where uh, a baby face got hurt, disgruntled, whatever, no longer available, 
and you're shorthanded of, of, a, of a box office baby face, you generally look to the top heel that you got that might be able to fill that role. And uh, so that's what you're, you know, Triple H, uh, he, Triple H should have been the baby face going forward uh, and would have, would have got over. Like I said, I used that reference earlier, but he returning from his injury in the garden. My God, uh, the Austins, the Rocks, uh, all those guys. Nobody got a bigger pop than Triple H did coming out in the garden that night. Right. So it tells me that people would, would accept him. They believed in him. They respected him. They may not like his in-ring tactics, but they sure as hell respected him for being a tough guy and being a very top-level pro wrestler. But, you know, Triple H didn't want to do it. He didn't want to go heel or baby face. And Vince acquiesced. And so all of a sudden, we're still scrambling. We're still scrambling. And uh, it would be a while after that that we could get half-assed, get the deck back together uh, with some new people, new faces. We had to get new. We had to get different. We had to get some new faces there. And uh, it was, it just caught us with our pants down. We just weren't ready for those. We weren't ready for the overall rejection of Stone Cold. And the Stone Cold, uh, the lack of popularity, the lack of success affected the whole card. It affected everybody. It just wasn't the same vibe in the building, Conrad, if that makes any sense to you. It does. The, the vibe was not there anymore. We, we, we became vibeless. And, uh, but, you know, that was the road to, that was the road to travel. Let's talk about, uh, the finish of the match here. Meltzer would write, take a choke slam Austin, but Stephanie distracted referee Earl Hebner. Hebner then shoved Stephanie off the apron. Kane did an enziguri, but triple H crashed into Hebner tagged to undertaker who gave triple H the last ride, but Hebner wouldn't count thinking he wasn't the legal man. Another ref bump. Austin did the stunner on Kane, but no referee. Stephanie gave triple H a belt to use, but Kane used a high kick on him. And then on her, this set up Vince's run in with a sledgehammer. Kane went after Vince, but with the cameras missing a finishing sequence again, triple H hit Kane with the sledgehammer to the head and scored the pin. Uh, it, it's pretty crazy to think about that we're missing the finish of a pay-per-view like this. Uh, does the blame for that wind up on the agent or Kevin Dunn or someone else? Well, it's not Kevin Dunn's fault. Right. Uh, certainly. Uh, I don't know if it's the, it's the agent's fault, but you got to communicate. The agent uh, has to communicate with the, with the truck. And they had these meetings before the show start with, uh, I think Kerwin Silphie's was a director. So it, Kerwin would have been responsible for catching those shots after being tipped off in the, in the pregame of what, what was going down. And those are meetings I tried to avoid at all costs because it preconditions you. And I didn't want to be preconditioned. I want to be at least spontaneous if possible and add some reality to it. Uh, but it was, it was a community. It was, you're right about you're on the right trail, lack of communication. And, uh, so, and the other thing, Conrad, some of those things that we're talking about that they missed, they may have been audibles, right? They may have been where nobody knew they were going to do those things. They called it on the fly. And with those four guys in that match calling things on the fly would not surprise me whatsoever. Cause I think all four of them prepare, uh, preferred to do that old school, call it. Or what's the crowd reacting to? Or are they buying? Or are they not buying? Let's give them what they're buying. So it could have been that, but it was very uncharacteristic to miss uh, vital uh, segments of a match, specifically the finish uh, for a WWE camera crew it, uh, or the truck or whatever. But that would go back on the director, uh, but it might not be the director's fault. We should also mention that there was another miscommunication in the match. Meltzer would write something happened with Austin and Kane. As you could tell, there was a major communication problem. Kane went for a clothesline and Austin was out of position and not expecting it. Austin went for a back suplex and Kane wasn't ready and didn't jump for it. They had some trouble later. You know, these are two primetime players. They've been in pay-per-views main events at this point for years, and you would never expect to see this sort of miscommunication 
in a WWF main event, perhaps back in the day with WCW, but not here. And, you know, I know that this isn't our topic today, but this bungled heel turn that we don't have all of our ducks in a row, maybe for the way we hoped with Austin. And now we've got a miscommunication. It feels like one thing after another that are leading up to Austin becoming increasingly frustrated with each passing day. Is that fair to say? Yep. Sure was. And I'm sure he felt like the match was stinking, uh, during, during the match. Hey, look, these guys are already seasoned, uh, talented veterans. They know when it's going well and they damn sure know when it's not going well. And, and, and it may be so minute to the, to the naked eye that we, we are fast fans who don't know the finish or are, are, well, I didn't see anything too wrong with it, but the talent in the ring can tell you what's not feeling right and what's just not working because I know that Kane and Austin had no issues. They weren't like a, a little personal vendetta or, or something. There was no dirt here. Now I can make some dirt up for you websites that need clicks. I'll just come off the top of my head and give you some shit here. I can incriminate Conrad. He was there as a young man. And he didn't buy a ticket. So you know what I mean? It's just, uh, so there was no issues between the two guys. It's just one of those nights where things were not clicking. And I think that was across the board in a lot of areas. And, uh, and I think that's why in Meltzer's poll, more people were voting in the, the, the biggest category that percentage that was of the voters were thumbs in the middle. So here's what you got. So you got a main event with the undertaker and Kane versus stone cold and triple H and the best votes. The most votes we get are thumb in the middle. You would think that that main event alone should have been enough to pull the wagon over the top, but it sure as hell didn't. Let's jump into some questions. We got tons of questions here. This one comes from Ray. He says, why did angle and Benoit just chill together? So great. Respect. Uh, they both had the same tough mindset. Uh, they both respected the business. They both are highly skilled, proud men who uh, had no problem laying bodies on the line and, and working a little snug because uh, they knew that somebody, neither one of them were going to go call their mama or their agent or somebody uh, and uh, have to be talked off the ledge because they got some bruises. It is too tough son tree. They liked each other too. They liked the competition. Who was really the better worker? See, the boys asked the same question. I'm asking you. Who was the better worker of the two? I mean, in my opinion, I think most people would say in this era. Very subjective uh, question. So, boys and girls, that's going to do it for us here on this very special edition of Backlash 2001 for Grilling JR. We'll be back next week to watch Super Brawl 1. Uh, hopefully you'll join us. Jim and I are both going to watch that show and get ready to discuss a WCW pay-per-view, the very first super brawl from 1991. And uh, in the meantime, Jim, I'm going to head over to jrsbbq.com and I'm going to sauce it, baby. I appreciate you saying that. Other are likewise, it's real simple folks. It costs nothing to look at jrsbbq.com and we do appreciate your business we absolutely do both on the sauce side of things and on adfreeshows.com until next week he is at jrsbbq i am at hey hey it's conrad and we are out of time we'll see you next week right here on grilling jr with the voice of wrestling mr jim ross heavy on the mister and thanks folks for listening hope you enjoyed the show see you next week Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.